Thank you for joining our second session of the North Dakota Reclamation webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about pipeline rec reclamation. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we start. Um, I'm Miranda Meehan. I'm the Livestock Environmental Stewardship Specialist um, at, with NDSU Extension, and I also do some research within the area of reclamation. And I'm part of the North Dakota Reclamation Conference Planning Committee, uh, as well as Natalie West, who is also one of our panelists, Brenda Schladweiler with BKS Environmental, one of our other panelists, um, Toby Stroh with Dickinson State, Carl Rockman with the North Dakota Department of Environmental Quality. Our next webinar is going to be March 17th, and we are gonna be talking about innovative approaches to reclamation. Today, we'll be joined by Aaron DeJoya with Pilgrim Construction Company, and then Nicholas Berkheimer, who is a master's student at North Dakota State University. And Nicholas is going to be our first speaker this morning. Um, Nicholas is a graduate student in the Natural Resource Management Program, who is currently working on his master's degree in soil science under the direction of Dr. Tom DeSutter. He has spent the last two years, um, work, two summers in Williston, North Dakota, working at the Williston Research Extension Center um, to determine efficient pipeline reclamation strategies for farmers in the Bakken Three Forks region. And following the completion of his master's, he plans to continue to apply and expand his reclamation knowledge to help develop the best strategies for producers and oil and natural gas companies alike. Awesome, Miranda, thank you so much for that introduction. So with that, let's just hop right into it. So today my colleague Aaron and I are going to be talking about the about pipeline reclamation and assessing pathways to restoring disturbed soil properties. So what I think is a really important thing to start this conversation with is what happens to our soil whenever we get into a pipeline reclamation setting. So I love starting this topic off by exploring it with the model soil. So here we have our model soil profile that you'd commonly see in the Bakken region. Note that we have our shallow organic matter rich A horizon, which is what's so critical to agricultural production within the region. It's loaded with organic matter, nutrients, and it's relatively porous so that plants can easily move through it and are able to access those nutrients and water. Below that, however, we have our subsoil, our B and C horizons, which are enriched with clays, salts, and carbonates. All of these have properties within a pipeline reclamation setting that can lead to reduced soil fertility. Salts cause osmotic stresses on plants, which cause them to wilt. Carbonates increase soil pH, which reduces the availability of certain plant nutrients to plants. And then clays, um, since they are the smallest soil particle, they end up being more easily compacted. So when we're dealing with a reclamation setting where we have all this heavy machinery, we end up getting a lot of soil compaction whenever we get clays introduced into the topsoil horizons. So now whenever we get into our disturbance, as we know, we take our topsoil, we scrape that off the right of way and it's stored adjacent to the right of way. Subsoil is excavated from the pipeline trench until the pipeline is installed. And then we repack subsoil on top of the pipeline trench and we respread our topsoil over the right of way area um, until we, and then ultimately we get into our reclamation phase. Now, what happens here is that we take our undisturbed profile and we end up with a lot of soil mixing, like you see here. Now, as you can see, our topsoil layer is a lot less dark than it was originally. Our organic matter has been diluted now that we've introduced um, clay, salts, and carbonates from the subsoil into the topsoil. So not only is it harder for plants to get at that critical organic matter, but there's also these other factors that play in the topsoil that lead to decreased fertility like we see here. It's very important to note that this doesn't have to be the case within every reclamation setting. If before we go in for a construction project and we're able to map out the topsoil and see how that varies in depth over the course of our project and that we're able to take extra care and caution in scraping our topsoil, storing it properly, and then respreading it, we're able to mitigate the amount of soil mixing that we have within the right-of-way setting. It's important to note that this isn't our only big problem. Um, I'm going to introduce the topic of soil compaction here. Aaron's going to talk about a little bit more, but I think this is a really good time to start talking about this. So a big way that we measure soil compaction in these settings is to look at soil penetration resistance, which is measured in the amount of pressure in pounds per square inch it takes to break the soil and thus continue to move through the soil profile. Now, once you hit a PSI of about 300, 
plants really aren't able to break through the soil anymore, and thus they stop being able to expand and they stop being able to grow. Now, what you're seeing here is penetration resistance data taken down to 20 inches at a pipeline right of way in Williston on our research site. You can see the orange line for our undisturbed. That hits about 300 PSI, but then it goes back down again, and it doesn't quite break 300 PSI, so we're still seeing a pretty full soil profile that our plants are able to grow in. However, on the right of way with the roadway and the pipeline, we're breaking that at about three inches. So when you think about that, we're technically only have about three inches of that topsoil that we're working with in terms of what plants are able to access. So that's an idea of how you can measure it in field, again, with a cone penetrometer is what we used here. But let's see what that actually looks like. So these pictures were taken at our research site by Samantha Crote. And you can see our three big areas that we have. I want you to first look at the very top above the compacted layer. You can see that the soil looks relatively loose and everything is kind of formed in soil aggregates, which are which make it really easy for plants to move between those aggregates and for water to be able to be transferred in there. Next, the native soil structure, we have this strong prismatic structure. It's able to support our soil profile, as well as you can imagine water and nutrients moving across the edges of that very easily. But in the middle, everything just looks smushed. Everything has been kind of compacted into one solid mass where we lose that pore space and we're not able to break that. What you're looking at here, that compacted layer, that's the exposed subsoil that we had in our right of way. So all of our respread topsoil was put on oh, was put on top of that, but then where we had our heavy vehicle traffic, that's where we see the most of our soil compaction. At a closer look, you can see here our root growth is essentially stopping right there at that level, and then we really aren't able to get much fertility out of that, as you can see in this picture, where we compare our undisturbed roadway and pipeline sites. Our undisturbed sites doing relatively well. The roadway just is not able to establish at all, and the pipeline it's doing better, but we're still seeing that effect of that reduced fertility. So when we get into what our barriers to a proper reclamation are, we know that we need to restore our soil nutrients to the topsoil. We need to alleviate soil compaction, and we need to consider what methods we're going to be using, what's efficient. First off, we need to consider what methods we're able to implement where we don't have to keep going to a site and keep applying reclamation amendments. And we also need to consider how important the effective time is. There have been studies that have been shown with ample time, ample rainfall. Um, you're able to get back to your undisturbed or your pre reclam or your pre pipeline installation levels of fertility within the first couple of years. So if things return naturally, that could be something that you know maybe we don't have to go through this big reclamation process. But there's also something to think about is what do farmers have at their disposal? So a lot of these goals that we're looking at, especially with uh, managing soil nutrients and getting those to a sustainable place, we've been seeing a lot of that within the field of agriculture recently as it is. Um, we've been having issues with conventional tillage has been leading to reduced fertility um, over time. Um, certain unsustainable cropping systems have led to decreased fertility. So farmers are trying to consider, okay, how can we have more sustainable cropping systems? So now we're kind of going to start looking at what are some more sustainable crops we've been seeing implemented recently that maybe we can apply in these settings to restore these soil properties without interrupting a farmer's operations. And the first one is field pea. It's a dry land cash crop. And to tell you what dry land means, dry land means it's an agro ecosystem where we don't apply water outside from precipitation. So no irrigation, no center pivots. It's all just coming from rain. Now, the reason why peas are pretty successful is that they have a pretty low water requirement. They're not very big and they're able to succeed in these regions without having a ton of water, which is also important because you think about compacted settings, there may not be as much of an ability to transmit soil water. Additionally, and probably most importantly, is that they can fix atmospheric nitrogen. They form symbiotic relationships with, with rhizomatous bacteria on their roots and they're able to take um, atmospheric nitrogen and convert it to a form that's plant available, which helps us start to rebuild those soil nutrients that we lost with our organic matter dilution. Additionally, the pea residue, so everything that you see in this picture that's not the pea pod, the stems and the leaves and the flowers, when those are returned to the soil, they have a chemical properties, or sorry, a chemical makeup such that they are very easily returned to the soil and mineralized into a plant usable form. So we're getting those nutrients back into the soil very quickly, as opposed to having those stored up in like a wheat stubble or a corn stubble that's not going to mineralize as well over time. Now that kind of solves our nutrient problems. Looking more at compaction issues, we can turn to something like safflower, which again is a dry land oil seed crop, 
What's important about this is that it has a taproot system. So as opposed to having numerous roots which kind of spread through the soil to look for water and nutrients, it invests heavily in one strong root that kind of goes straight down. Think of it like a, a carrot or a radish root. And so what that helps safflower able to do is that it's more resistant to compaction. It can break through those layers. It can also access soil nutrients and soil water that other plants maybe wouldn't be able to access, which helps it be a little more drought resistant, which again is great in regions like this. Those are cash crops we're looking at. Now we can consider a cover crop mix. Now a cover crop mix isn't really a cash crop. It's a cropping strategy that's meant to manage soil nutrients and soil water. What it is, it's a mix of crops that are able to grow well. So we can see stuff like barley or sorghum. It has crops like radishes that can fight compaction with those strong tap roots. And then those nitrogen fixing crops like peas and vetches, which are able to fix that atmospheric nitrogen, have that eas easily mineralizable residue and then return all those nutrients to the soil. Additionally, by having a crop planted over the soil, you're gonna reduce the amount of evaporation and water loss that you're gonna have. So you can store water for future plants. It's important to remember that for most cover crops at the end of the season, you're not gonna be harvesting it. You're gonna be terminating the crops and returning that residue to the soil and then kind of relying on the next year. So it's sort of like a long-term strategy of like, okay, we're not gonna make money this year, but by having this management strategy, we're gonna have really good yields next year. So remember that when we plant these, the farmer's not making money. So if these quite don't quite pan out, it might not be the best idea, but if these can get us back to a initial undisturbed setting quickly, that'd be fantastic. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at our experiment where we take, where we look at these three crops, integrate them into cropping sequences and test the orders of planting them to see how, what effect they have on pipeline reclamation. So for our study, we had a six year reclamation study at the Williston Research Extension Center. It started in 2015 when a three foot diameter water pipeline was installed under about six acres of agricultural land. And we identified three main um, disturbance regimes. We had our traditional no-till undisturbed agroecosystem at the site. We had the roadway, which you can see here on the right behind the truck. And then we had our pipeline trench. And so on these, we planted these five different cropping sequences. Look at the first four years and you'll see what these cropping sequences entail. For treatment one, we had continuous durum. This is our no action treatment. Going back to that, that idea of, well, what if we don't do anything and things can restore themselves over time? In treatments two and three, we tested the different orders of planting peas and barley, sorry, uh, peas and safflower with barley and durum in between. Um, again, to see what happens whenever we can put that end back in the soil and if safflower can fight that soil compaction. And then additionally, finally, for treatments four and five, we have our cover crop mix planted into Durham, and then we um, uh, tested different timings of planting those. In years 2019 and 2020, we did our response testing. So we planted all plots in Durham in 2019 and all plots in Safflower in 2020 to kind of gauge the response and see across all plots, how did these sequences do, what ended up being the best, what ended up not working, or what ended up dead working. So now what I think is important, again, when we think about reclamation, we get back to talking about baselines and what happened. So let's assess what our baseline was in this study. You can see initially in 2015, we saw significant losses in Durham, Peas, and the cover crop mix between the disturbed and the undisturbed sites, our greatest losses of which were on Peas, which, which were experiencing between 75 and 85% yield losses between the disturbed and the undisturbed sites. They did not take well to this disturbance action. And a lot of that is due to the soil mixing as well as the compacted environment on the roadway. What I find interesting is that the least yield reduction we saw initially was Durham. Durham was able to produce significantly greater yields on the pipeline than the roadway. It was still less than the undisturbed, but when we're thinking about yield losses that are this significant, if year one, we can already start to see, okay, this isn't doing so bad, that might be a decent strategy long-term. What this kind of tells us is that initially, compaction is more of an issue than soil mixing is for Durham productivity-wise. The cover crop mix was doing pretty much the same across disturbance sites. A lot of that you can equate to, again, we have a wide variety of crops. Some of those will do better than others. Um, and so we're able to, they're able to find niches where they're able to take off and do well. So that's kind of our initial um, thoughts. Roadway and the cover crop mixes were doing, roadway, Durham and the cover crop mixes were doing at a similar level. Um, Durham on the pipeline was the best and peas overall were the worst. Now let's take a look over the whole study, get kind of a bird's eye view as to what was happening. So the data that you're seeing here is that we're taking sample, is that we're taking the yields from each treatment within each year on the pipeline and comparing those to the undisturbed 
to see what's happening over time. Now, I want you to start by following the red line. That's our no action continuous cropping sequence of Durham. You can see year one, we're seeing reduced yields and then it gets kind of better year two. By years three and four in 2017 and 2018, we're getting back up to the level of the undisturbed, if not passing it, but then we drop down again. What's happening in 2017 and 2018 is that water becomes a big factor. In 2017 at the site, we had a significant drought. And in 2018, we had massive rain effects so what we end up is our two kind of boundary conditions for water. We have no water and we have too much water. And what that does is that those kind of end up nullifying the effect, at least with this treatment, of our disturbance sites. And so that's kind of the effect that you're seeing there. What I think is most important is that you look at 2019 and 2020, we're hovering around that 80% mark, which we found that overall between the roadway and the pipeline, compared to the undisturbed, they were producing approximately 80% of the yields on the disturbed sites to the undisturbed in the last two years of our study. So what that tells us is that our no action response is that we're going to get back to about 80%. Not bad for doing nothing, but can we do better? You can see here by the end of the study, our cover crop sequences ended up approaching about that same point. Yes, there are some points in the study where they're doing fantastically. Actually, what you're seeing here, those big peaks are when we play with the cover crop mix. But following that, they still did pretty well. They were still looking at about 100% or about online of where the undisturbed was. But by the end of the study, the nutrients that are, were added back to the soil from the cover crop mix have kind of leveled out. And things have kind of settled down to a similar level to the Durham plots. What I think is interesting is you look at our two green lines, the, aqua, the uh, more aquamarine line, that is our first year pea planting, which as you can see did abysmally year one. But by the end, it ended up producing on the same level as, if not a greater level, than the undisturbed. And then our first year barley planting into peas, which did well here one, and then just could not catch up after that. What we think is happening here is, again, it's an early effect of that pea residue. You're seeing that while we did have bad pea yields, we did put N2 back in the soil, and we did add that... Um, crop residue, which was able to be easily mineralized and get the soil back to a level of productivity. You can even see that by year two, our aquamarine um, first year pea planting, that's getting into a point where we're getting back to that 80% um, level that we're getting by the end of the experiment. So we're starting to get to that reclamation level already. Now, when you look at the barley, you think about barley, it's more of a nutrient exporter of a crop. It's going to take up those soil nutrients and remove them from the system. And then the residue that it leaves over is going to mineralize gradually over time. And it's going to kind of offset the soil nutrient supplies. So kind of what we think that we're seeing here is that that initial trying to mess with things in that order ultimately just ended up reducing fertility over time in this setting, unfortunately. Whereas if we take that loss year one with our pea planting, over time, we're going to start to see big returns. It's a very similar story to the roadway. What I think is really interesting is if you look at years 2019 and 2020, we didn't get back to that. None of our treatments got back to that full reclamation site. This kind of tells us that, okay, maybe safflower wasn't as good as breaking compaction as we thought it was. We didn't get back to the 100%. We're getting above 90%, which is great but we never got back to that full reclamation status, kind of telling us that there might still be some work that needs to be done here over time. I think what's also interesting now, so that's kind of the big story of the roadway, a lot of similar things to the pipeline, but we still have some problems to deal with. Now, I think a great way to kind of end this is that we look at our final results from our final year when we planted safflower. You can see that the only treatment that was able to fully homogenize between all disturbances was the first year pea planting into barley. Uh, the letters that you're seeing, by the way, in those columns represent significant differences between um, disturbances within each treatment. So those three A's that you're seeing down for the P to barley, that means that none of those yields were significantly different from each other, representing a full reclamation. Now, where we are seeing differences, significant differences between the undisturbed and both disturbed sites are first year barley planting into P and first year durum planting into the cover crop sequence. This kind of tells us that whenever you're getting into this sort of reclamation strategy, you don't want to wait. You want to get right in there and you want to start planting your amendments immediately. Um, even when we had those second year plantings of these crops that were supposed to be able to help us out, things were kind of thrown off initially by that um, barley and durum planting so that we couldn't get back to that level ultimately. 
What I think is interesting too, is that if you look at our control treatment, remember in year one, when we had our pipeline was doing significantly better than the roadway. Well, now that's flip-flop, the roadway is doing better than the pipeline. Something to think about too, is that pipeline settling, I think is an interesting issue to think about here. In 2018, we had a subsidence occur on the pipeline um, where we ended up about having a meter wide section subsiding about two to three feet in certain parts. But overall, the soil just kind of slumped in on itself. You can think about the roadway setting. You have that compaction level that you're going to be dealing with throughout the course of your reclamation. Um, the pipeline is a, more is a more dynamic system in that it's going to be settling over time. So you do have those effects of trying to reclaim soil nutrients, trying to get that and trying to get those back to a good level. But you're still dealing with this kind of more dynamic system as a pair of posts of the roadway. And that's kind of what we can equate to what's happening here. Here is that the roadway nutrient cycling might be a little bit more back in place, but the pipeline physical soil properties really just kind of settled out there at the very end. So to kind of wrap up this portion of my talk, I think the biggest takeaway is, is that we do have methods for using certain crops to reclaim lost yields in a pipeline reclamation setting. And, uh, and that it's really important to initially get those planted in as soon as possible. You might take an initial yield loss, but that's gonna be made up with over time. And also I think the last important takeaway is that in this setting, you can get back to a reasonable level of yield over time without applying any treatment. So that's also another management strategy for us to consider. So I'd like to thank Miranda now for inviting me on to talk and I'd love to pass it on to Aaron now, who's gonna take us into a really deep and fascinating talk about soil compaction and what that looks like and I'm leaving that in this system. And so as Aaron's getting his slides up, Aaron is a director of environmental solutions for Pilgrim Construction. He has over 20 years of consulting experience. Um, he is a licensed um, professional soils classifier in both North Dakota and Colorado. Um, he had received uh, his bachelor's and master's from Kansas State University. And Aaron has helped reclaim over a million acres of dr drastically disturbed land in the U.S. and is one of the leading soil science consultants in the reclamation field. He has been asked to be part of many innovative reclamation projects including thousands of miles of pipeline right aways and has so he has a unique understanding of reclamation vegetation and stormwater techniques that increase reclamation success and ultimately decrease soil erosion. Aaron's reclamation and stormwater practices have been designed to be constructible, effective, and need minimal maintenance. And with that, I'll turn it over to Aaron. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, Nick, for the great intro into what I'm about ready to talk to. Um, Nick and I discussed this uh, about a week ago and we're amazed at how close what I see in practice um, he's finding in the field at the same time. But, you know, one of the main components of any reclamation program, as Nick alluded to, is this compaction effect. We're constructing these right of ways and oftentimes not ideal conditions, as you can see in the picture, um, and causing this soil compaction. But the question is not if we're causing it or not causing it. We kind of know we are. It's how do we fix it? And to start to begin to understand that, we have to understand the factors that are affecting compaction. And those are being soil type, soil moisture, vehicle weight, and type. Everyone considers that, you know, a dozer is the most worst machine to be out there. Well, when you look at a whole pipeline construction process, there are many factors out there. Those including the stringing trucks, which are probably the worst, but also just vehicle traffic, the, you know, small trucks that continually run up and down the pipeline right away. So all those factors play into this. And also, we have to think about what happens after construction's ended. I've talked to many farmers that the first thing they want to do is go put manure on the site, get the honey wagon out, start driving it over. If you look at the weight of a, a manure spreader or a honey wagon, per axle, it's much worse than some of the biggest equipment that's used on the right-of-way. So being able to hold that off until later on when the soil has more structural strength is the better way to do that. Um, so not just looking at construction only, but also 
farmers trying to help themselves and help the reclamation process can sometimes hurt themselves. And they have to understand that this is a process and that it takes time. And starting with some situations over the others is not always going to work in the favor of everyone. But managing construction compaction looking at when we're operating, looking at what vehicles are out there at certain times, weather conditions is critical. And that needs to be based on the soil type, soil structure, soil um, textural classes at the same time. All soils can compact. Some are just easier to compact. Others are easily easier to decompact. So all that matters. So compaction, decompaction. We have to remember that 80% of any compaction occurs on the first pass of the equipment. So it's not so much the repeated traffic, but it's getting, it's that traffic at the wrong time is going to put that compaction into the system. And once it's in there, now we have to deal with it. So anyone saying, well, we only drove on it once, so it's probably not compacted that's probably an incorrect statement and we still need to be worried about compaction on those sites. Some severity of compaction increases with increased traffic. Yeah, the first pass is the worst, but continual passes have impacts too. Increased equipment size. And this is not just the total weight of the piece of equipment, but the axle weight of that or the PSI that's being applied to the soil surface is going to dictate how deep the compaction goes, but also how much compaction is there. Soil moisture, as I said before, we would love to stop construction every time it rains, um, but that's really not feasible in these situations. So we have to understand when that soil moisture is going to occur, how deep, how significant that is in terms of compaction. And then as always, if you are not worried about site-specific conditions and looking at this by a track-by-track, parcel-by-parcel basis, you will not know what's going on on your piece of property or your right-of-way at any point in time. So without site-specific information, you can't find the causation, the depth, and what the reclamation plan needs to be to extract that compaction out of the soil. And it must be measured on every parcel. Just because one parcel has compaction doesn't mean the other one's going to have the same compaction in the same places. Construction changes, even though it's the same process, based on soil moisture, soil type, the equipment used, and when that equipment's used in that moisture regime. And then moderate compaction. This, this statement's very important but moderate compaction below 16 inches is more severe or more problematic than severe compaction at, in the upper 16 inches. People question why I say this all the time. And the reason is, is that normal agricultural equipment that we can use after the construction can get to 16, 18 inches and break up that compaction Roots are more active in that top 16 inches, so we can break up that compaction, begin to rebuild that soil profile, the soil structure. Once you're below 16 inches, you have to bring in a whole different set of equipment that most landowners, most construction companies do not have. And then you have to find those deep-rooted crops, like Nick pointed out, the safflowers, the turnips, the radishes, to go down and keep that soil stabilized until structure can be redeveloped. So always be concerned, not only about the severity of it, but where it is in that soil profile on that. Here's a couple pictures I have of right-of-ways. Um, they all are, both of these pictures are compacted soil right-of-ways, but they're illustrating that compaction in different manners. On this one, we're looking at, we have a lower right away so that soil is compressed. It's a little bit lower. We are getting ponding water, ruining crops, having trouble growing crops in that, but it's more of 
excess of water because of all the drainage and no outlet for that water. On the second picture here, you're looking at an alfalfa field that you can see right where the right away is because on this field, it's droughty. It's too, the crop cannot get any moisture in here. There's no depression of the right away. So it's even. And on this right away, I love to tell the story. I went out, I dug a pit on right away, and I was ch literally chipping the soil out of the hole I was trying to dig. And trying is probably the best word there. Well, then I have to go take my off right away sample, expecting hard soil again, stepped on the shovel, and I literally fell over on my face. That shovel went clear to depth with one press. I just went tumbling. But that's the severity of compaction that we have here is one you could not hardly get it out of the ground. The other one was just mellow and nice, kind of like what you'd expect from an alfalfa field. And these are pictures of the plant growth there, very similar to what Nick was Nicholas was showing earlier, where on the right hand side, you see that alfalfa plant just sending lateral feeder roots out. It hits that compaction at six, eight inches and just can't go any further. So it just starts sending roots out to the sides. On the off right away, which is on the left hand side there, you see that nice deep straight tap root with some feeder roots leading off of there. But that's the difference where the off right away alfalfa plant was able to go to get that deep moisture where the compacted right away, that plant has to survive on the top six inches of soil. It has nothing else. So it is, is either flooded or it's dry and there's no happy medium through there. Um, so I just like showing that picture to show those signs of compaction. And any farmer, any person, right away agent can go out and see this. And this is a sure sign without a penetrometer, without grabbing bulk density measurements. You can look at the root systems to determine where compaction is and what, how deep or how severe it is on there. So again, we had very similar, I kind of laughed when I saw Nicholas's presentation, very similar um, graph here using the constant rate cone penetrometer. Um, they're, they're great machines for determining compaction. They don't tell you exactly everything. Bulk density is a much more accurate predictor in my opinion, but it's much more intense to gather to get good data from, and then to be able to make management decisions. Um, a good compaction cone penetrometer or a constant rate cone penetrometer can give you valuable information relatively inexpensively and consistently. But on this one, kind of what I want to show here is that, again, we have our 300 line here that Nick was showing you earlier. But we, I've also put on 180 PSI line on here. The 180 PSI line is where you start, you can start to see different plants be susceptible to compaction. Um, sometimes they have less impacts depending on the root growth strategies of that plant. But we're going to play with that 180 line here. Um, and you can see on the spoil side of the right away, that's where they store all the topsoil, subsoil on there. We begin to see soil compaction at that five, five inch depth, goes down to 13, 15 inches, and then comes back in line with the off right away, which is the green line, which is always under 180 until you get about 25 inches below the soil surface. Um, but then you start looking at the center line, which is hardly ever goes above the 180 PSI line. Why is that? Well, they dug that up, they've loosened it, they've taken all the compaction out, and now it's nice and loose and friable. Usually we don't see too much compaction there, as Nick was saying, 
a lot of times when you do see yield impacts on the center line, it's going to be, as Nick mentioned, the nutrient cycling, those nutrient issues. But then you look at the traffic side. This is where it gets hammered throughout the right of way. And we start seeing high compaction readings after 15 inches all the way to depths. And people ask, why are the spoil side and compaction side different? Well, the main reason for this is you've got to remember, approximately six to nine inches of soil were removed from the soil profile, and that's where they drove. So this is really at approximately six to nine inches below the soil surface of where they drove, where on the spoil side, this compaction likely was introduced during movement of soil back onto the right of way. So it starts at six and goes to about 11, 12 inches below the soil surface from where they drove. So all you have to remember where you're at on the right of way. This compaction here on the soil side is much easier to deal with once topsoil, you know, if topsoil is already placed, then this compaction below um, from the traffic side on that. And again, just this graph is just showing these differences here. So how do we manage this in a right-of-way situation? This is this traffic side shows a perfect example of why we would want to deep rip that section of the right-of-way and really the entire right-of-way before putting topsoil back on so that we can remove this compaction with normal agricultural equipment before we put topsoil back on, put topsoil, and then see if we need to remove that compaction from putting topsoil back on. Um, so we have to worry about this as we go through there. And again, this compaction in the spoil side, the blue line, is starting to repair itself. It's being able to, the root system of the normal system can take care of that. Where this on the traffic side would need some help, deep compaction, deep ripping, and then a deep rooted, tap rooted crop afterwards. So now I want to talk about decompaction tools and non decompaction tools. Um, you know, everyone thinks that, you know, thinks of a deep ripper, um, and but also they sometimes consider a disc a decompaction tool. Yes, a disc loosens up the top four or six inches of soil, but it's also putting that compaction back in there. And then you've got two different styles of rippers here. This is a 36 inch um, parabolic ripper that we've used. And it was the piece of equipment we had to bring in to remove that compaction from the right of way we've seen before. Um, it's hooked onto a quad track and costs a fortune to do. Therefore, if we can use something like this deep ripper here, uh, before we put topsoil back on, remove that compaction, put topsoil back on, get the crops growing again, you're going to be far better ahead. Um, but even if we have topsoil on, we can do it. Um, it just costs more money on that point. What is effect? What does effective deep decompaction looks like? Well, first of all, we've got to lift and shatter that soil. So we want to see a wave going as we decompact. Compaction done right will not displace large clods of soil. You should not be seeing a lot of soil mixing, a lot of soil being turned over. If you are, it's likely because the the piece of equipment is being ran too fast. You want to run compaction equipment at one and a half to two miles an hour. Doesn't make a lot of operators happy, but that's where we get the most effective. All we're doing in, on the right-hand side here is bringing up clods, that then we have to bring in a disc, add more compaction, break those clods apart, and really we are not being successful. 
where you see over here, much larger piece of equipment, there is no turning over of the soil. It's just lifting and shattering that soil. Um, we also want to make sure that we don't have too wet a soil conditions. You know, you look at the picture on the right here again, that deep ripper is not doing anything. It is slicing instead of lifting the soil. Um, this is, you know, they're going too early. They're, they're probably putting more compaction in there than what they're actually alleviating at this point. The other important factor to look at on the picture of the right is the deep ripper is not wider than the tractor. So without that ripper being wider than your wheelbase, you're not, you're putting compaction back in through that dual wheel there. So you want to make sure that your ripper is bigger, wider than your tractor so that you're ripping outside of your wheelbase and you're not continually kind of alleviating compaction and then on the next pass back, you're taking, putting it back in there. And this might be for both of you, actually, you could get both your perspectives. Thoughts on other variables in evaluating soil compaction rather than the penetrometer data, such as bulk density, water infiltration, et cetera. And I know Aaron touched on that a little bit, but maybe you guys want to or elaborate a little more. Sure, Aaron, do you, do a, do a, you want to start us off on this? Yeah, I'll start. Um, you know, there's a lot of different methods that you can use out there. The comb penetrometer, the new innovations in those devices to be able to get um, PSI readings every centimeter or two centimeters is just amazing. So you can get such detailed information. Yeah, it's got to be interpreted correctly because you got to know how dry the soil was, you know, all the factors that affect it, dryness of the soil, stoniness of the soil, um, multiple other parameters. But for speed, efficiency, and if looked at with a reference site next to it, you can get some valuable information there. Bulk density is the gold standard, in my opinion, but most of my clients don't have the time or money to go out and collect good bulk density documentation. What's your opinion, Nick? I absolutely agree with you on the penetrometer resistance side and that it is a very complicated measure when you get down into the nitty gritty. However, when you want to get these measurements quickly and efficiently, you're going to be able to get a good idea of where your compaction is in your field um, while putting in the least amount of effort. I do think it's interesting to look at, let's say, um, infiltration. Um, we did do an infiltration study using a Cornell rain simulator one summer, and it was taking about an hour per sample to go in and get a proper reading about how much penetration we were getting. It's great to think about water penetration in that way and see how it's moving through your soil profile. But if you have the time for it, that's great. If not, it might not be worth it. And going back to bulk density, I think it's important that it becomes more difficult, especially whenever we have soil strength as high as we get out west, it becomes difficult with the depth to get a good bulk density sample. So you're not necessarily going to be able to get that through a compacted layer or even lower than that. We struggled with that in our experiment to get good bulk density. But again, going back to what you said, there's pros and cons for each one. It's just that penetration resistance is the quickest way to do it and get decent results. So would you consider early mowing early season to stimulate more growth of the cover crop? Or um, from my personal bias, maybe here is be, consider possibly grazing that cover crop to, later in the sometime during that growing season, end of growing season, maybe speed up that nutrient um, breakdown while still leaving a little bit of residue on that site as well. For sure. So when I think about the early season, Again, I'm just thinking about the early season aspect. I'm not as familiar with grazing aspects of cover crops, but with the early season mowing, one thing that I think is important to note is that cover crops aren't always a shoe in for ensuing, aren't always 
sorry, they're not always going to result in increased yields following it. You may have too much nutrient cycling to the point where you get to a point where there's excess carbon or there's excess nitrogen. You may be removing too much water from the soil. That's a big problem with cover crops. And so when I think about really stimulating that cover crop residue that we're getting, you think that we could start to maybe edge in on that situation. And again, it all comes down to a site to site um, considerations. If you do have those sites where it's like, man, we really lost a ton of organic matter, we gotta rebuild that, or maybe water is not as much of an issue in your site, that could absolutely be something that you could use in order to really get that organic matter built quickly. But it's important to take those factors such as putting in too many nutrients back into the soil or using up too much soil water, those must be taken into consideration as well. And the other thing I'd like to mention on the cover crops is don't always think that um, above ground biomass is your primary focus on here. Mm -hmm. In the reclamation sequence, the below ground biomass is much more important than the above ground biomass on a cover crop strategy, in my opinion. Um, and these cover crops are designed, I mean, if you get the right cover crop mix like Nicholas did, you can have tremendous impacts with very little vegetative growth. It's, I've seen some amazing things from them. Thank you. Um, so just before we go to the next question, for those of you interested, that Tom put a link for more information on the penetrometer in the chat box. Um, so looking at, we have some more questions rolling in. So how would compaction alter someone's decision, desired native vegetation community? Are there alternatives to mechanical methods um, such as biological? And this is open to either of you. Sure, so from what I've seen in the literature, a lot of what you get with these disturbed sites is you're welcoming an invasive species. As soon as you get that soil mixing and as you alter the soil environment, not only do you you are hampering the ability for native vegetation to grow properly, but you could be creating an environment that's ripe for an invasive species um, to come in. That's kind of a real broad interpretation of it. But in terms of what can happen with your vegetation community, that's a very serious issue that we get. Not to mention the fact that you might even have, there's a potential for invasive species seed to come in with the, rec with the um, reclamation or installation itself. Yeah, and keeping those invasive species out is critical. Um, that's going to be, most of the times they are not well suited to form soil structure. Again, I'm, I go back to my soil scientist in me, is that I'm looking at what's going to help us build up soil structure as fast as possible. And those are those deep rooted crops, those crops with a fibrous root system. A lot of times these uh, noxious and invasive species come in and just kind of do everything you don't want them to do. They use soil moisture, they don't have good roots, and so on and so forth. Aaron, I'm going to give send this one your way since you're a certified soil classifier. Are NR, is NRCS soil survey data sufficient for determining soil characteristics on a parcel by parcel basis along the right of way? Absolutely not. Um, these, especially in North Dakota, I've looked at so many miles of pipeline right away up there. Um, the NRCS is, data is awesome. It's good for getting your head wrapped around on what problems you're going to have, but it's not detailed enough to be able to tell you what is what impacts you're going to likely have on this section of the right of way or this parcel. Um, you know, there are, in North Dakota, the soils are so complex and it is throughout the United States, but just in North Dakota, you can have a very saline sodic soil right next to a wonderful mollusk. The impacts from construction are going to be completely different. And if you do not take the right topsoil, I'm a firm believer in you've got to take topsoil or you're never going to have successful reclamation. If you take the right amount of topsoil on those saline sodic sites, you can be successful. If you take a little bit too much, you're in big trouble 
and have to start for a pretty awful situation. So you led very well into our next question. So is salinity, sodicity severe due to compaction or have you had observed any issues where that's com com complicated your compaction? The saline sodic situation, um, I've seen it from both perspectives of, as Nick was talking earlier, the mixing of the soil profile. So you're getting that saline sodic subsoil mixed in with your topsoil causing huge issues. But I've also seen that when we get that compaction in and it's near those areas, we'll raise that saline sodic profile up closer to the soil surface and then actually start impacting this soil. So they both have their place and that's why it's so important to do site specific analysis instead of broad based analysis is that you have to understand what that pipeline construction methodology is going to do to your right of way. Nick, I know you probably saw some of this on your research too. We didn't see as much saline or sodic issues at our site, but it was a lot of the carbonates. Um, I thought it was really interesting. We would have sites where we put in um, probes for soil water measuring, and then all around the lip of them, it would just be white because we had such a level of evapotranspiration ringing up all the carbonates. But we did, especially on our roadway sites, we saw a lot of those um, sites with um, high calcium carbonate values. And you can think of it too, this just kind of, I just kind of thought of this. If you do end up incorporating those from the subsoil, and then they're over the compacted layer, it's gonna be much more difficult to wash them down with the effects of water. Um, it's like Tom always says, you know, like you control salts through water movement. So if you can't necessarily flush them through the compacted layer as well, that's gonna be more of a pervasive issue. Tom also just texted me um, to remind us of something that um, if we have de decreased porosity within the soil, which we get from compacted layers, it will lead to a higher rise of capillary water, which would end up drawing up salts. Thank you, Tom, for your insight, as always. Yes, thank you. And as Nicholas just alluded to, Tom is the, the go-to guy in anything related to brine and salts in the soil in, at, at NDSU, at least. And if you missed last year, he, he gave a wonderful keynote at our reclamation conference on some of our brine spill remediation work that we're doing here in North Dakota. Um, so as we kind of wrap up, um, questions are kind of slowing down. Aaron and Nick, if you want to give us a kind of your take home from today, one thing you want folks that are on to walk away with and remember as they move forward with the reclamation process. I think the most important thing to take away is that while we did cover a lot of broad issues today, um, it's important that site for site, everyone's going to be different. You know, every right of way has its own needs. Every right of way has its own deficiencies. So it's important to identify what those needs are, as well as the needs of what the land order wants to accomplish out of this. Um, as we talked about, we have a variety of methods that might not be as efficient for all people. Um, and we even might have methods we can just say we don't do anything and we get back to a decent spot over time. But I think the most important things are is that we come armed with this knowledge and with that ability to cooperate, and then we're able to achieve the best reclamation possible for each situation. Yeah, I agree with Nick. It's site-specific. Do your site-specific work. Um, that's going to save you the most money throughout the life of your project. Um, and also, don't, don't skip the steps. Um, soil compaction, like we said, with the new constant rate cone penetrometers on the market. These are efficient, effective tools. And you're going to cost, if you don't decide to skip compaction relief on the traffic side before you put topsoil on, you're going to save $10, but you're going to charge yourself about $40 to $50 on the back end of that. Four to five times is what it costs to run a deeper ripper. And so concentrate on the steps and don't skip them and be site specific are my goals. Okay, we've had a couple more questions come in. Um, first one is, 
Have you used straw from wheat or corn stubble to help reduce compaction? Um, we commonly do this in remediation work in the six inch to three foot zone. I have not used that technique. I've seen some um, straw pellets, um, people looking at that technique as a deeper go. Um, the problem we have with using those techniques is we've got such large areas to reclaim and getting that, getting it incorporated is the hard part um, on that that I've seen. Okay. Other one that we have is how would you um, comment on the dilemma between potential issues of mixing topsoil subsoil versus compaction from leaving topsoil in place? Um, this, the, the, the person got it, the sense that you know compaction can be a bigger issue but is fixable unlike soil mixing. Um, I think one thing to remember is that a lot of our soil mixing issues can be solved with sufficient water movement over time. Stuff like, um, again, our carbonates and our salts can all ultimately be washed out. It is gonna take time to rebuild the soil organic matter, but soil mixing is something that we can fight over time in a way that's not as severe as soil compaction. Um, again, it's gonna come from a site to site basis. Let's say if you have a big issue with the calcareous subsoil or sodic subsoil, and you really don't want that getting in your topsoil, then you're definitely going to want to um, avoid that more than a compaction situation. But I would say that through proper management, it probably is easier to deal with a soil mixing issue over time, as opposed to dealing with a deeper soil compaction issue that Aaron talked about. Yeah, and just quickly, I, I don't think you can have, you can take one or the other. If You've got to address both of them. You've got to remove topsoil, strip topsoil. You may mix some soil, but guess what? It's a natural system, it will come back. And you've got to remove compaction from your system. If you choose to do one or the other, you're going to fail on the other. So it's either do both or you might as well not do either. Um, they are, it's a process. Thank you, Aaron and Nicholas, for joining us today. I think that we're kind of ready to wrap things up. For those of you that are still on, um, next week we will have, we're going to be focusing on innovative reclamation techniques. Um, Sam Crote at, with Stealth Energy and Harold Rose with Summit Midstream will be joining us in the same time. And you can register for the same spot, but your registration link from, from today should work as well to, to join us. Um, if you missed anything or have questions, um, the recording will be on the, the North Dakota Reclamation website and feel free to reach out to either Aaron or Nicholas for additional information. So thanks again for joining us today. Mm -hmm.